everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you so much to Melanie for coming in as well. Uh, SoulCycle inspires such strong emotions and devotion from its uh, riders. My former producer is a hardcore SoulCycle rider, and she always made herself available 24-7, except on Mondays at noon, <laughs> <laughs> when she was booking next week's classes. So that's when we couldn't find her. But uh, we've now got the woman in charge of the operation, CEO and former COO, yeah. Melanie Willen, to give us more insight into the company, the brand, the experience, the movement that really SoulCycle has become. So let's start with you personally, because you came to SoulCycle as an operator. The three co-founders have moved on. So I want to start with your personal background here before we get to the company itself. Um, for many of our featured speakers, and for those who uh, are here every month, you know that many of our speakers have entrepreneurship in their family blood. And your father was an entrepreneur in Baltimore. He started and exited several businesses. What types of businesses were they, and how did that influence you in how you thought about building your own career? Yeah, so um, I grew up, I'm 41, so I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland in the early 80s. And my father was an entrepreneur, which back in the early 80s wasn't quite such a thing as it is today. Uh, but he started transportation companies for the most part. Um, he started messenger businesses in the 80s, and then with the advent of the fax machine, exited that business and started a sedan and bus company in, in Washington, um, where he saw great opportunity. And so I grew up in a home where my father would get up every morning, fitness was core to his routine. At five, he would go and work out. He would commute down to Washington, and he would, he would start these businesses. And then in the evening, um, when he would come home, I, I have, have these very vivid memories of my mother helping running payroll on our living room floor while my sister and I were doing homework. And I remember going down to Washington on the weekends and helping him set up offices. And so this sort of the DNA of an entrepreneur is very much in my, uh, my whole family history. Um, and it's really influenced a lot of the decisions that I've made in my career, primarily because I have these phenomenal family vacation memories where you know, back in the 80s, we didn't have cell phones. We had these, like, briefcases that had phones in them, <laughs> speaking to a technology audience. Um, and he used to take a phone call no matter where we were in the world, no matter what vacation we were on, because if something was wrong, he really felt as the CEO of the company that that responsibility mm -hmm. was his to hear them out. Not, not every problem, but once something had really escalated, he would always take a call from a client. And he always said to me, people just need to be heard. They don't, I don't need to fix it. I'm not probably going to be the one who can fix it. And some problems just can't be fixed. But if you hear someone out, you're going to win and own that relationship for life. And you can always make it up to them. And so whether it was a messenger delivery gone bad or a driver that didn't show up at the airport, I, I just remember him walking around on the beach saying, I understand, <laughs> I understand. And it sounds funny, but at the end of the day, you know, my career, I worked at Starwood Hotels, and I was on the team that started Virgin America, the domestic air carrier. Um, I was at Equinox for, for a bunch of years working on a, a couple of cool projects with them. And then at SoulCycle, at our heart, what we really do is create a community space that's all about hospitality. Mm -hmm. And what we really believe is that people just want to be seen, heard, acknowledged, and appreciated. It's really just that simple. And if Scarlett can walk in and I can know that she's not having a good day because I can read it on her face, and I'm going to get her that bike that she wants, and I'm going to make sure I've got a retail bag for her after the class. It's really not just about the fitness experience. It's about that hospitality connection. And that, as we have grown SoulCycle, is something that we have always tried to impress, hire, train, and reward on our teams is this sense of true connection mm -hmm. and connectivity, whether in the room or in the lobby. That's a lot of quality control. It's a lot of hard work <laughs> to make sure that you're staying on top of that. Um, you mentioned you started off at Starwood, then you shifted to Virgin, both in corporate development. Obviously, then you moved on to Equinox and eventually to SoulCycle. Do you remember your first experience with SoulCycle? I mean, what specifically do you still hold with you as you go about what you do now at a much higher level? So wait, who here has been to SoulCycle? Who here loves SoulCycle? Okay, great. Most of the people that have been to SoulCycle, which is great. Um, so yes, I very much remember my first experience with Soul, and you loved it right away. I, you know what, I loved an aspect of it. So I, um, back in 2008, right on the verge of the GFC, I was running business development, which meant all strategic growth for Equinox at the time. And what I figured out pretty quickly is in an economic crisis, there wasn't going to be a lot of strategic growth for the company. <laughs> and so I went um, to our executive chairman and I said. Um, what else can I do here? Because if we're not going to be pursuing these strategic initiatives, what else can I figure out? And we said, together, let's go find some cool stuff that maybe we can buy or partner with, because sometimes in a downturn, these smaller startups can't survive, and there mm. might be something cool for us as a bigger brand that we could 
um, capitalize on. And so I went and I tried everything. Um, and I found SoulCycle. And I'd heard about it from friends. It was on the Upper West Side. There was one location. This was in 2008. Um, I was pregnant with my first child at the time. And I came in and all I truly remember, we had 32 bikes. It was in the rear lobby of a building on 72nd Street. It was a former funeral home. We had no sign on the door. And I just remember the energy in the lobby. Um, I don't remember the class that well, but what I remember the most is when I got back to my office the next day, I got in a silver Soul Cycle retail bag, a Soul Child onesie with a handwritten note from one of our co-founders, Elizabeth, saying, thank you so much for coming in. It was wonderful mm. to meet you. XO, Elizabeth. And it wasn't, I'd like you to come back. It wasn't, we're running a deal on a five pack. It wasn't anything other than a simple thank you. Mm -hmm. And so back to my point around being seen, heard, acknowledged, and appreciated, what I really took away from it was, this is something totally different. Mm -hmm. This is a community of people that really get it. And this is a group of people that really want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And so, you know, very long story short, we ended up acquiring a majority of the business in 2011. And that's when I went over to, to, to help kind of prove out our investment thesis. But, you know, when we bought the business, there were seven studios. It's all in New York. Our thought was we could open 25 in New York, LA, and San Francisco, maybe. Um, and the story's been wildly, wildly different, but that sense of hospitality and that sense of connectivity. Yes, the quality control is hard, but if you hire for the right behaviors mm -hmm. and you hire people that naturally want to be the best part of somebody's days, it kind of takes care of itself. And part of that quality control means that everyone in the company needs to be well-versed in every aspect of the company. Um, you've mm -hmm. said that there's a certain value to being in the studio and interacting with customers. You want to be at the front desk, and you learn more from that experience in 30 minutes than you would looking at a spreadsheet or presentations all day in the office. So if that's the case, give us a meaningful insight that you most recently gained from a front desk experience in, in interacting with your customers, with the riders. So I can give a, an example that happened last week of a rider who called me um, from one of our studios and said, there's a situation that you should be aware of. Mm -hmm. And I got on the phone with her because when our writers asked to get on the phone with me, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I will always take the phone call <laughs> um, because of my father. And she explained something that she thought was going wrong in the experience. And if I looked at the numbers mm -hmm. on our daily report, it actually doesn't look like that at all, that we maybe were losing some of our most tenured writers because of a circumstance or our retail business wasn't performing because of, of some reason, but the way that she told the story and what she said was actually happening in the lobby, I was then able to make a couple of phone calls and figure out something that was going underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky because she called me. Mm -hmm. I wish I could be in 90 studios every day. We have a great team, and I think they're unpacking a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But it's another example of like, I, we always say if one person is saying it, 10 people are thinking it, and 100 people have experienced it. And so taking that one phone call or working that one front desk shift in Tribeca on Saturday afternoon, you're going to learn so much. Then the challenge is how you separate the signal from the noise, mm -hmm. how you get to the root cause. And that's where I think the data and the numbers come in. Um, but oftentimes it just starts with that one conversation. And you come back to that idea of hospitality and customer service and connecting with that 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 customer. Who is your typical customer? Because SoulCycle has been around for now a decade, right? Um, how long has he or she been riding with you? And describe how he or she has changed over the years. Yeah, it's interesting. So we're turning 13 in April, which I can't believe. Oh, more than 10. Hopefully that's a prosperous number of some kind. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about Soul is we have 14-year-old teen spin that's sold out, you know, every day of the week. Um, in many of our suburban studios. And then I have riders at 83rd Street who are in their 80s who've been riding with us for 10 years. So we always say we much more appeal to a psychographic than a demographic. Mm. Um, our whole mission here is to move people, to move the world, and to completely democratize fitness. And we believe that you can come in and have this great experience no matter what kind of music you like or what it is that you're facing in your life or what fitness level that you are. And so do we have you know, the sweet spot demographics that we look at, 25 to 40, 75% female, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, but the truth of it is, the, the long tail on this brand is where I think a lot of the excitement is because it really does appeal to a broad demo. What we've seen in them over the course of the last 10 years is they've gotten a lot stronger. Mm. So we joke a lot that soul's like a gateway drug. You start with this fun fitness experience and then you're like, oh my gosh, I can cross train. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna go to bed early because I'm meeting my girlfriends in the morning. I'm not drinking during the week anymore. I'm sleeping more because I'm genuinely tired. And all of those healthy habits ladder up to this healthy lifestyle. 
And so the challenge for us is then how we continue to evolve our experience to meet our riders where they're going, as much as continuing to welcome new people into the fold who are then are hearing about how lives are transforming on the other side. Do they only attend SoulCycle or do they use other fitness studios, have other workout methods? How, how has their needs, how have their needs changed? Because fitness is now very much um, a much bigger thing than it was, say, 13, 14 years ago. Absolutely. Everyone's involved in it. There's this whole wellness industry that's been built up. Absolutely. I mean, we were the first mover in boutique. There's no question. Our founders saw an opportunity, and the boutique fitness industry really didn't exist 13 years ago, and mm -hmm. now it's an industry, which yeah, right. is kind of funny to, to, to think about. So are our riders doing other things? Absolutely. Um, we ask them a lot what, what else they're spending their time on. Um, and a lot of it is cross-training. A lot of it is... Um, outdoor activity, but what we hear time and time again is that soul isn't about the fitness really at all. It's about the community and it's about the experience and it's about the music and it's being with 55 other people in a dark room with your phone put down. Which if you think about it, when was the last time you put your phone down for 45 minutes while you were awake? Hopefully everyone's week? doing that here right now. <laughs> <laughs> But the truth is, it's really hard to shut your brain off. Mm -hmm. And what we really give you an opportunity to do is get in a dark room with 60 other people around you, listen to music, and there's no time that you can actually listen to music you like and be unhappier on the other side, and have an inspirational instructor tell you that you can be stronger on the other side of this hill and share these lessons in life, which you think are just coaching you through the bike, mm -hmm. but are actually things you can take out into the world. And so I hear this all the time. I read a lot of our feedback. Um, and pe our writers will say to us, what the message I was left with helped me with this problem at work, helped me with this problem at home, helped me get through cancer that I'm fighting. She made me stronger mentally so that I could go out and face whatever I was facing. So, you know, again, they're doing other things for fitness, but I think for what we do, which is this inspirational coaching, hospitality, music-driven moment, um, I still think we're the best out there. Or even therapy at this point. Um, fitness, of course, very, very difficult, very intensely competitive business, especially in the last five to 10 years. How do you situate or think about SoulCycle in the landscape of other fitness companies? So, I mean, I really believe because we have this unique relationship with our riders, the opportunity for us is not just to offer them great fitness, but a whole lifestyle around what it is that we create. So one of the things we just launched in the last couple of weeks uh, is a vertically integrated retail business. So for those of you who ride with us, you know we sell a lot of merch. It's part of the experience. I always say it's like Disney. Somehow I go with my kids and I come out with mouse ears every single time. I don't know why, but those ears remind me of the great experience that I had when I was with my kids in the park. And our merch is no different than that, right? You want to take a piece of that experience with you. And we've been doing this since you know, the beginning of the, the brand, but what we've done in the last 18 months is we have built the team and the capability to make our own product. Mm -hmm. And while that sounds simple, athleisure as a category is very crowded. And so it was really important to us that we, from the beginning, build a product that was suited for our workout, co-authored by our instructors and our riders, mm -hmm. to be best for our workout, but also best for their lifestyles. And so we birthed something called sound, uh, Soul by Soul Cycle. Um, that we've launched in our own studios and we just partnered with Nordstrom on a wholesale um, distribution partnership. And what that does is enable us to take what is just a brick and mortar experience and extend it outside and give even more audience the opportunity to experience a little piece of soul. So we have a whole series of initiatives really wrapped into this idea of the brand is much mm. bigger than the 90 locations and mm -hmm. what else can we offer to our riders. Okay, so branding is part of it, whether it's through clothing or through other partnerships. But quality of experience is critical here. And um, one thing that you need to do is rely on your instructors in a way that perhaps um, Gold's Gym, and I'm throwback from the 80s, may not have had to. Um, the, the reliance on your talent is in a way similar to Wall Street banks. I think the financial filings showed staff costs were about 45% of revenue. How do you ensure that your talent stays put, that they don't defect to somewhere else because they get paid a little bit more by another fitness uh, gym? Yeah, I mean, we've, what we've always believed is that we are a talent company mm -hmm. first. And so starting from how we scout and look for our instructors, we call it American Idol on a bike. We travel around the country, we pop up studios, we audition hundreds of people for every training slot that we have. And the reason that being an instructor at SoulCycle has become a coveted career is because it's exactly that. It is a career. You know, the fitness industry, um, it, really hasn't given fitness instructors a place to call home mm -hmm. historically. Um, you're teaching boot camp on one side of town, you're running to teach yoga, maybe you're doing a private training session, and it's a lot of hustling 
versus investing in one place where we can invest in you. And so we offer our instructors you know, full-time salaries, we offer them health benefits, paid vacation, retail allowances, and more than anything, I'd say, we offer them career trajectory. So many of our um, instructors become training officers, scouts, um, managers of other pieces of the business, and so they really see this as a lifestyle choice for them to the extent that it be, even becomes part of their own identity. So um, while we have you know, experienced some very small turnover over the course of the, over the years, the majority of our instructors stay with us because we build the business together. So to what extent does your reliance on that quality of your talent limit your growth potential perhaps? I mean, from what I'm hearing, it doesn't sound like you could ever franchise because you would never be able to have that quality control. Yeah, we, for us, our growth has been very disciplined and controlled. You know, brand is paramount for, mm -hmm. I believe, any quality experience. And so our ability to grow is, while it is constrained, it's also, I would say, very thoughtful in terms of where we want to place the brand and how we want to place it there. Um, and we invest just as much in the ongoing operation as we do in the future of the business and the brand uh, because we want to make sure that our riders stay with us day in and day out. I mean, remember, this is a, you know, we open most studios at 5, we close at 10, we operate 365 days a year. We, as we talked about, we're anniversaries, we're milestones, we're holidays, we're turkey burns, we're all of it. And making sure that that can happen consistently is really important because Ultimately, I, I believe a brand is a promise, and your promise is only as good as your product, and our product is people. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that we have the right people in the right seats to deliver that promise. You've got, what, 90 studios in 20 U.S. markets? We do. And then you also have uh, studios in Toronto and in Vancouver. You'll soon be opening one in London, as we heard. Um, what are the prospects for scaling beyond what, what these are typically premium markets? I mean. Is Baltimore or St. Louis going to get a, a SoulCycle studio? I know. Last time I was in Baltimore speaking to a group, I got heckled to the point that I thought I was going to have a tomato thrown in my face when I said, not next year, but maybe the year after. Listen, I mean, absolutely is the short answer. We've been opening between 10 and 15 studios a year for the last six years. Um, our pipeline, you know, we, we've got five-year roadmap in terms of where we're opening, and we believe that this, we have figured out how the model will work in these smaller markets. Can you do it at the same price point or does that need to change? Yeah, you know, we actually don't have the same price point in most of our markets. We make sure that we are geographically relevant to the market mm -hmm. that we're in and mm -hmm. so we uh, we will absolutely consider price point to make sure that we are still the premium offering in this in the uh, markets that we're going into but um, you know in New York we're $36 right now and that that we know that that's not going to work. Right. Okay. Now we talked about Equinox earlier. The founders of SoulCycle sold the company to Equinox in 2011. What's a relationship? What's SoulCycle's relationship to Equinox? Um, where you used to work, of course. How do you interact with other brands in in the Equinox family? Yeah, it's it's actually been a wonderful relationship because what Equinox does really well is real estate development and acquisition, and you know, operating a brand at scale. And so they have been phenomenal advisors and partners to us as we have grown this business. Um, but we decided from the beginning that we were going to operate completely independently. So our cap tables are actually different. I have my own board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we have our own office space. We have our own ethos, our own culture values. Um, so they are, you know, they're great partners to us, but we're pretty independent in terms of how we run the company. Now, for years, a lot of analysts and observers have been saying that spinning has peaked. <laughs> are, are they wrong? How are they wrong? They are wrong. I'll tell you why. Mm. So spinning, or indoor cycling, because you can't say spinning, so that's trademarked by a guy named Johnny G. Oh, indoor cycling, right. as a modality. <laughs> Did not know that. Um, is one of only a handful of ways to get a cardiovascular workout, right? There's running, there's boxing, there's swimming, there's indoor cycling, or outdoor cycling. Um, it is the only cardiovascular workout that is actually proven that you can do for years and years mm -hmm. because it is easy on your joints. The workout is completely customizable through the resistance knob. And what we have found over the course of time is that we have athletes coming to us and people who have very intense fitness routines coming to us because this is a workout that they can see themselves doing for a really long period of time. That is just the baseline of what we do. Then you put on top what Soul Cycle is, which is experiential, music-led, community-driven, and wrapped in this really great lifestyle experience. And I think that is something, because it is underpinned in a workout that is safe and is proven to be effective, um, is something that I think has great staying power. And I, I think we're really only at the beginning of what we can create. People want different challenges when they work out, though. We mentioned some of the customers, the riders who've been there for 
from the very beginning. Um, how do you bottle that same soul cycle experience, the experiential part of it, but in a different format so that it doesn't get stuck in a rut? Because yeah. any workout that you do for years at a time will feel kind of old after a while. Yeah. I mean, what I find is um, because every playlist is unique, every instructor brings a different message to their room. Every room feels different. You're riding at 6 o'clock in the morning. We call those our rooster riders. That is a very intense group of people mm. that want to get in and get out. Mm -hmm. And then your 9.30 class is a little more social. They've got a little more time on their hands. You know, the studio can feel different over the course of the day. And every class, you know, we, we spend a lot of time training our instructors on how to create playlists that are really inspirational. Um, it is something that what we've seen with our riders is that they continue to commit to but they also do want to be challenged, which is why we offer programs like Warrior Week, where we, we challenge them to ride a certain number of times. We offer a class called Activate, we launched last year, which is all about high intensity interval training that you can do on the bike with heavier weights. Mm. Uh, we do so it still has minutes. the spinning component or the cycling component. Everything's on the bike. Right. Everything is on the bike, but there's lots of different things that you can actually do on the bike mm -hmm. in terms of how you know, the, the workout, for those of you who have not been um, to Soul Cycle yet, which we're going to fix by the end of the week. It's 45 minutes with a five to eight minute arm series toward the end. And we take you on a very specifically choreographed cardio journey over the course of it, put the weights in and then bring you home. Activate spikes your heart rate really fast and keeps you up there, which gets you a different cardiovascular benefit. So there are different ways to train on the modality that we're exploring and some that have already launched. And then you put the music layer on and the mm. instructor layer on. And it's really because it's an experience you really can get something that you can do for your whole life. What about non-cycling classes? There's a Soul Annex as well, right? We did. We launched a, a pop-up last year um, called the Soul Annex. The idea being that if I like riding with Olivia, by way of example, I just want to spend more time with Olivia, um, we offer a space where Olivia can bring her ridership and cross-train with them. Um, for some instructors, that may be a yoga class. For some, that may be a hit class off the bike. Um, and that will be a part of our story going forward to, to take our talent, which is really the underpinning of our experience, and give them more opportunities to connect with our riders off the bike. And I'm glad you bring up talent again because, as you mentioned, there's an apparel line. There's also a talent agency for instructors that Soul has, SoulCycle has, has come up with um, in partnership with others, as well as a media division, too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different areas <laughs> that you're expanding into. How do these extensions all tie in and tied together around the, the, the rider experience. Walk us through that. Yeah, so my view on this is really simple. We have our riders for 45 minutes a day. I want the other 23 hours and 15 minutes from you. <laughs> and so I'm going to work with our team to figure out how we can meet you where you are, when you are. Um, our people are really time starved. I get asked all the time, who's your greatest competition? And I mm -hmm. always say, it's just time. People are so busy. Netflix is so good. There are so many other ways that you can choose to spend your time. I have to make sure that this is the best use of your time, not just your dollars, because your dollars, that's one thing. But if you waste someone's time, that's just offensive, right? And so if I can figure out a way through a great retail product, through an inspirational text message, through a playlist that's got inspirational coaching layered on it on Apple Music, through a concert, a live experiential concert that we're launching in Los Angeles, we just did in Harlem earlier this year. There are all these different ways that we can meet our riders where they are. And when we ask our riders, 86% of them consistently say to us, I want more time with your brand. Hmm. It is the one brand that promises to make me feel better and delivers every single time. So now the opportunity is just how we prioritize all of those different ways that we can meet them where they are. That's where the talent division comes in. We want to make sure that our talent has access to these great opportunities, but also has a roadmap and understands why they're participating in all these activities. And that's what the media division is for, is to figure out how else we can amplify this experience, both within the studios and on content, but then also live experiences as well. So we launched a, a studio in Las Vegas last year. People said to me, you are insane. Who wants to work out in Las Vegas? Turns out a lot of people want to work out in Las Vegas, and we're doing these live stream concerts with the DJs in Las Vegas into the Soul Cycle studio. So for those that don't want to have that nightclub experience, you can come into the studio and experience these great DJs, but do it in a really healthy fitness-based way. So you Vegasfied a class we did. In, in many ways. We did. We had the chain smokers come in in December and took class. We had confetti guns. It was like, there are things that probably should stay in Vegas. <laughs> um, but the whole idea is like, 
fitness and active lifestyle, it is just the way of being now. It isn't a trend, it isn't a macro trend, it's just what the consumer expects. They want to live these high performance lives mm -hmm. and they want to have these amazing one of a kind experiences. If you can't put it on Instagram, was it even worth doing, right? That's what all the people are saying now. So our whole ethos is let's create those one of a kind experiences for our riders and we can do that in a way that's really healthy. So for that talent agency, um, does the agency bring outside deals to the instructors? I mean, can they supplement what they do at SoulCycle with something from outside as long as it's within and consistent with the SoulCycle brand? I mean, can they add on to the salary that they make at SoulCycle? So some of it is um, helping our instructors parse through the external opportunities mm -hmm. to understand what makes the most sense for them. Mm -hmm. It's mostly focused on the internal opportunities, candidly, because there are so many with all of the different growth channels of the business. And the media division, um, one of the initiatives includes exclusive tracks and playlists on Apple Music that are curated by the instructors. My question is, how is that different from playlists that someone who's inspired by a class at SoulCycle might put on Spotify themselves? That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather just someone give you the playlist that you heard that day? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I, it's, it's something that comes up, though, because I th a lot of people, my producer, for instance, would always talk about SoulCycle and the music there and how it was so incredible. And I've got to think that there are people who think that they can replicate that on their own. I think th there are, and there are great curated playlists out there um, from other brands. And you know, Starbucks has curated playlists as mm -hmm. well. If I believe I had a great experience at Starbucks, I'll probably go on to Spotify or Apple Music and find that music. I think for us, it's a way for our instructors to amplify their taste, mm. which is really what they are as tastemakers in their communities, and amplify it to a broader audience. So meet your producer who was in the class this morning, but also maybe meet the person who's in Baltimore, Maryland, who doesn't have the opportunity to engage with our brick and mortar experience, but is going to the gym in Baltimore and just wants to hear something great. There's a there's a promise and a quality that comes with the science behind how we put a playlist together. Mm -hmm. And we believe that that should be democratized for more people than just our riders to experience. Now, as we mentioned, this is a Cornell Tech sponsored event. And we have a lot of people here in the audience from the tech community in New York. And as you had mentioned, part of SoulCycle's appeal is that you can leave the technology behind, right? Mm -hmm. You can set your phone down during the 45 minute class. Yet, how do you balance that with recognizing that tech could present opportunities for further engaging with that ridership? Yeah, so from the beginning, uh, we believed that your sign-up process and our hospitality platform should all be tech-enabled to make your experience as seamless with us as possible. And so while we are not a tech-led brand, we are very much um, tech-enabled from the back end. Mm -hmm. All of this great hospitality is only able to be delivered with a CRM program underneath of it so we really understand who our riders are and where they are. Um, and this is another w place where I think our riders have evolved over the years as sort of the quantified self and data has become a bigger part of the narrative for the fitness consumer. It's something that we're evaluating in terms of how we want to meet that trend where it is. But you know, we look at you know, other players in the space who think about leaderboards and data in the room, and that, that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. And we, we won't ever do that, but I think there is opportunity to give more information to our riders about their Is that something they're asking for? Um, not yet. Uh, what they come to us truly, like our, our, the, our, the core of our ridership comes to disconnect. Now, if we were able to tell them more about how they performed and they were able to opt into it, maybe that's something that they would want. I think sometimes consumers can articulate exactly what they want and mm -hmm. you have to show them what they want over time. But we'll be very mindful in terms of how we do that so that for those in the room that really just want that tech-free experience, that we'll have that for them. What about integrating technology with the experience? Streaming classes, at-home bikes, all of that. Uh, your competitors offer that. Is that something that's in the works or is it a possibility? We think that this whole idea of 23 hours and 15 minutes and getting that back will absolutely need to involve some version of the experience that you can take with you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe down the road. Um, how are you weighing future investment in additional real estate locations versus investments in technology? Because I imagine with 90 boutiques, um, there's a lot of time spent figuring out which corner, which street makes the most sense for you. Yeah. The capital allocation question is, is a really good one. I mean, that is the really hard. Um, I think that's probably the most challenging part of my role is 
we have so many great ideas and we fundamentally believe in the brick and mortar and we'll continue to invest there, mm -hmm. but really prioritizing how we think about that versus what we're standing up in the media versus um, how passionately and aggressively we want to go after the retail is something that we are spending a lot of time talking about. Um, fundamentally, you know, we believe that fitness is an accountability game and it's a community game and as excited as we are around experiential and media and some of the content that we are going to be bringing to market, we want to underpin that in a really strong community base and so we'll continue to invest in, in our brick and mortar. SoulCycle, based in New York, um, where many young companies have emerged in the fitness industry as well, why do you think New York has become ground zero of the fitness industry as opposed to LA, which would make sense, um, or San Francisco? That's really interesting um, because I think LA there's a lot of great fitness in that market, and uh, you know some of our initial instructors. You know we were recruited from LA to come out here, so you know I think New York is a great market with a consumer base that moves around and is willing and open-minded to travel, uh, traveling and trying a lot of new things. Uh, but I think there's great fitness happening all over the country right now. There just happens to be an incredible proliferation of offerings here, I think, by virtue of the density of this market. Yeah, makes sense. And some, I, I was just thinking maybe there's a connection to the P industry as well because private equity owns a lot of these fitness boutiques overall. So there's, you know, it's close quarters. Um, SoulCycle filed for an IPO in 2015. It's since withdrawn those plans. When I talk to people who follow the IPO scene, they say that the market, and that's Wall Street, um, wanted SoulCycle to go public more than SoulCycle needed to go public. Uh, getting a high-end fitness boutique to list on the markets would give bankers a benchmark, um, a benchmark on valuation, hard numbers that they can then take to other fitness boutiques um, to say, you know, this is how much money they raise and this is what you can do. And that would allow their founders or their backers to cash out. What do you think of that? that possibility, that analysis? Is that, does that make sense to you? I've not heard that before. Uh, maybe. For us, we have great strategic investors who've always taken a long-term view on the business. You know, at the time when we filed, it was a different market mm -hmm. and you know, we didn't need the capital at that time. Uh, we still don't need the capital to execute our long-term vision. So um, Related and Equinox have been great partners to us in that way. And so we've really, in everything that we've done from our financings to our experience, we've really tried to stay focused on ourselves and challenge ourselves to do it better. So. It's just, it's not something I really thought about. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting that bankers would want to be able to take that to someone else and say, look, look what we did for them, and therefore, look what you have in front of you, money that's being left on the table. Um, final questions before we open it up to the audience uh, who have questions for you as well. How many times a week do you take a soul cycle class? Uh, <laughs> I ride between four and five times a week. Four and five times. How many and classes have, have you taken in one years. day, like the max in one day? Oh, gosh. I've never done more than two, I don't think. Two's a lot. Two. To, but a good double, is a, it's a nice way to start a morning. At 6 and a 7 a.m., it's a great way to start a morning. So all of this is very healthy. What's the most unhealthy mm -hmm. habit you have? Do you have one? <laughs> um, ice cream. I talk ice to my trainer about this a lot. I keep saying I'm going to give up ice cream, and then I see him on Wednesday, and he's like, how'd that go? And I always say, maybe next week, Eric, maybe next Still week. Still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's about progress, not perfection. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's open it up to the audience. If you have a question for Melanie Whelan, please raise your hand. And we've got microphones, and we'll pass them around, make them available. This gentleman in the front has raised his hand first. So, Hi. So how do you, you, you spoke about the great first experience you had where the the founder gave you that wonderful gift. How do you keep that level of service when you have 90 locations? So I would say it's a couple of things. First of all, um, we have an amazing team. And with the right operating team in place, anything can be executed. It starts from first defining what good looks like and what you stand for as a business. So one of the things we did in the very early days is say, what are our core values? What do we stand for? So we know the type of people that we want to hire and the type of behavior that we want emulated. And so at the top of our list of 10, and it's the same 10 values that we wrote down eight years ago um, today that we interview by, we review by, and we talk about all the time in the office, is we're a culture of yes. And what that means is I may not be able to get you the yes that you thought you wanted, but I am going to find a yes for you in this moment. And that could be you didn't get into class, I'm going to book you into the next class afterward, front row. I might get you into that same class next week. I might get you a piece of retail. I'm just, I'm going to find a yes for you. And that governor is how we think about how we hire people on our leadership team. 
how we hire people into our field organization and how we hire instructors onto the podium. And when you, th from that comes a whole list of behavioral questions, right? Tell me about the best part of your day. Tell me about the biggest mistake you made. Tell me about a time when you couldn't overcome an obstacle. You just hear how people answer that. You're just gonna hire for the right attitude. I say this all the time. We hire for attitude and aptitude, not experience. Because we can teach, at least in the field organization, we can teach everything that you need to know about how to operate a soul cycle studio. But what I can't teach you is when stuff comes flying at your face from 60 different directions and someone's yelling at you about a broken pedal and I want to buy $600 worth of retail and I know I can make my goal and I'd rather do that but I need to fix the pedal first, that kind of thinking really comes innate from who you are. And so I think our teams do a wonderful job of hiring great people, training them extensively, and then ultimately celebrating and rewarding the behavior that ladders back up to that set of values. <laughs> Another question? Right here, Katrina. Hi, so uh, you mentioned what uh, seeing your dad as a CEO taught you when you were a child. So what do you hope that when your children are on the stage you know, in 20 years, what do you hope that they're learning from your experience? That's a really good question. I would say two things. One is that your team is more important than you are and that your job in any kind of leadership position is to serve the people around you. And two, um, I believe that by raising a son whose mother is a CEO, that he will not see any or have any kind of bias in the world and will curate a board and a management team that is diverse naturally because that's just how he was raised, not how he was told to do it. Good answer. Next. Um, right here. Um, so as a luxury company, I know that the price point is a bit high for a lot of the audience, and I'm wondering if you guys have faced any backlash about inclusivity or um, anything like that, and if you've taken any initiatives to make it more inclusive or more accessible to more people. Yes, so I, I would say a couple of things to that. We were premium priced from the beginning, and we believe that the price of a class, because of the value of the class, is so much greater than a fitness class that we're appropriately priced for the experience that we are creating. That said, what we've evaluated over time is how we price packages, how we price first-time rides, how we pack, pa package what we call starter packs as people are coming into the brand, where you maybe don't understand the value of what you're getting because you're just trying to understand what the choreography on the bike means. So we play a lot with pricing in the beginning and in new markets to make sure that we're priced right for the experience. But ultimately, you know, Disney is expensive too because there's only one place you can get that kind of experience, and that's always how we viewed the brand and what it is that we're building. That said, on the, on the other side, you know, giving back has been a really important part of our story from the beginning because we believe that we have these incredible communities of people that have the willingness and the desire to give back to the communities around them. And many of our studios are right next to underserved communities around the country, right? We're in 16 different markets. Um, and we're in some of the most privileged parts of the country that abut these other underserved communities. And so we've created a program where we take our excess inventory, which is largely our non-peak times, and we bring in children from these communities, mostly teens that can actually use the bikes. Um, and we teach them not just about a fitness routine, but about how to build healthy habits in their lives, things like um, how to grocery shop you know, for a healthy lifestyle, how to sleep better, job readiness skills, other things that go along with a healthy lifestyle for these underserved populations. And what it does is it gives our teams in those markets the ability to extend their experience outside of our core ridership, and it gives our space back to the communities that are right around us. So that's how we've sort of thought about democratizing a bit of what we do into our broader community base as we've expanded. We have time for two more questions. Uh, this gentleman over here has had his hand raised the entire time. <laughs> All right, so you, uh, it was mentioned that you're moving or I introducing a studio in, in London. What uh, kind of research did you do or how is the environment different there than it is in, in New York? Presumably you have no like, prior experience from that soul cycle in, in London. So. Where are you from? Uh, near London, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, not, there's not much spin in, in London, actually. Yeah. So well, there's a couple. Um, it's not as good as here. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. So we, uh, we moved into Canada 
last year, and it feels like yesterday that we were moving into Los Angeles. And we've taken a very anthropological approach to all of our openings, regardless of market. We go in a year before, because we know where we're going. We spend a lot of time on the ground, understanding how people are trading in the area, not just for fitness, but for everything. Where are they grocery shopping? Where are the schools? Where are the parks? Just how do people in those communities move around? And what are they looking for in terms of connectivity and community connection? Because ultimately, that's really what we're building. It's not that much about the true fitness. Um, so we do all of that study, and then about 12 weeks before we open, we go into the market and we start asking the really good questions. What kind of music do you like? What time of day do you want your classes? Um, and we really make sure that we curate and cast, more importantly, our operators and our instructors to be relevant for that market. Because the music that they like in Houston, Texas is very different than the music <laughs> that they like in Palo Alto. And that's just the truth. And so in London, it's no different. And so we just have made sure, you know, we're opening in June. We have been on that ground in that market for three years, really listening. And the world moves fast, right? So just because we did it three years ago, it, things have changed a lot. And so we're making sure that the team is cast with some Americans and some people who are living in London right now. We are making sure that we are listening to the communities, the very the micro communities that we're opening in to make sure that we're being very respectful. Um, and then we're really getting under the hood on music trends and what people are looking for. Um, I've heard a lot that maybe the inspiring Americans should tone it down a little bit when we get over there. <laughs> we'll see. I'm not so sure that those, those <laughs> London people don't want to be brought out of their shell. Um, and then I would say, look, once we open the doors, that's when the learning really begins. And so it is just constant feedback. And we listen to every single thing that our riders are telling us so that we can continue to evolve as we continue to expand in the markets. It goes back to that idea of a hospitality industry, a hospitality company. Final question for Melanie Whelan. Uh, right over here, Pam. Hi, I have a question about your new media agency that you're opening. Is it gonna be like content where it's gonna be like, I hate to say this like another brand, but like Oprah Soul Sundays yeah. is gonna be like Soul TV. How great is Super Soul Sunday? It's really good, right? So it really is going to be a variety of content and experiences, some of which have already launched, to extend that feeling of magic that you get from being in the room. So we took over um, a church in Harlem six months ago now. We brought two artists, uh, Louis the Child and Ellie Dewey, who some people may know, some people don't, maybe don't know, brought them into the church, invited 350 of our riders, had 50 bikes on the stage as more performance art, and created this huge dance party experience. That's something that the media division is doing. In addition to the chain smokers rides in Las Vegas, the live stream rides, that, that kind of taking the fitness out of the studio. Um, we are launching uh, this content series with Apple Music, with our playlists. Um, and we have a whole roadmap of other things that we're bringing to market. But the idea is that if the talent finds a unique way that they want to connect with our riders that is underpinned in music and our brand, then the sky's the limit in terms of what we can build. All right, I want to thank Melanie Willen, CEO of SoulCycle, for joining us today. Thank you so much for your Thank time. you for having me.